Support for this episode comes from Modern Football Technology. Modern Football Technology provides real-time opponent tendencies and self-scout while eliminating manual data entry into Huddle, DV Sport, and Exos. If you're tired of tools that are time-consuming to learn and perform inconsistently at best, then we recommend Modern Football for a fresh perspective. Schedule a demo today at teammofo.com to see a battle-tested tool that's proven to perform and deliver value. Mention Coach and Coordinator Podcast or use the coupon code CC10 to receive 10% off your first year. And listen to our recent episode featuring Folsom High School Defensive Coordinator Jordan Ersick to learn more about how the 2023 California State Champion uses modern football to dominate their opponents. So a lot of problems with high school punters comes from their line, walking their line, right? Everything we want to do in kicking, punting, and snapping needs to be linear. So the easiest thing to do is get them on a line, right, across the field, and just have them punt back and forth, cross the line, cross the line. Brett Arkillian is an analyst and special teams coach for Fresno State and joins us today to get into the specifics of coaching punters, kickers, snappers, and holders. He shares a plan to prepare your players throughout the year, as well as giving insight into drills that work well to teach the most important aspects of each discipline. We all put a lot of time into the details of the scheme of each of our special teams units, so putting the details into these key players will definitely make a difference in the win-loss column. Be sure to stay tuned for our Winning Edge takeaways and ideas for implementation following the interview. What you see on tape is a direct reflection of what you teach and how you teach. Video is important, but if you don't teach well, you're not going to like what you see on your video. First Down Playbook has been helping coaches teach better for 13 years. It allows you to present installs, playbooks, and practice cards in half the time with NFL quality. Coaching tools like video pairing, a player app, practice schedules, and wristband sheets have made First Down Playbook a program management system with everything in one place. If you're in a position of leadership with your football program, receive a free one-week look at First Down Playbook. Call them at 512-814-6158 or visit them on their website or social media. Mention Coach and Coordinator Podcast or use the coupon code COACH24 to receive a $100 discount off the normal $700 First Down Playbook team membership price. Links and the phone number are in the show notes. On today's episode, we're going to dig into all things specialist and what you can do with the time that you have available, the resources you have available to get more out of their time in practice and obviously talk about how that translates to the game. And joining me to discuss all of that the special teams analyst at Fresno State, Coach Brett Arkellian. Coach, it's great to have you here on the podcast. Keith, man, I appreciate the opportunity. I've been a long-time uh, listener, first-time caller. You know, you've had some great coaches <laughs> that I've even ran into, uh, you know, Chili Davis, Ben Kawika, you know, Westoff, Coach Fountain, Mason, Lustig, like the guys I worked with, like Lechtenberg and Siegler. So, man, the chance to just sit down and talk with you, I'm, I'm fired up. I'm juiced up. Yeah, no, it's great to have you here. All you special teams guys gravitate towards each other. It seems you know each other. Robbie Disher's episode is up today, the day we're recording this, and you know he mentioned that same thing. And actually, a lot of the names you just mentioned there, so you guys are a tight-knit group, but, but you do important work too, and that's exactly what we're going to get into here today. Before we do that, though, I think you have an interesting story and in, in the things that led you to this point of being special teams coach and analyst at Fresno State and starting back to your experience in college, your first experience in college at the JUCO level. Yeah, 100 percent. Yeah. So where it all started was I was a, uh, a PJ Fleck from Minnesota loves to say he was king of the twos, right? Too small, too unathletic, too weak. That was me. Uh, I was five, six, nothing. Uh, 140 nothing, you know, and I walked on at uh, Fresno City College here in California, my hometown. I had a great work ethic, but the cool thing was, you know, I was essentially an equipment manager, Keith. Like, I 
you know, would practice during the week and would go with the equipment team on Saturdays and go fix up the helmets. I'd kick in pregame, and then I got redshirt. I was redshirt behind Quinn Brashears, who was a kicker at Fresno State and eventually transferred to Washington State. So that was great. I got to learn from him. He was a very, what's up, dude, very California <laughs> kicker guy, you know, but he taught me the way. He taught me the routine that I needed to have as a specialist and how, you know, we're always there to serve others and help others. And I ended up getting a call from Lincoln University. They called and they said, hey, uh, we need a white kicker. And I said, well, I, I am a kicker and I am white. So, But really what that was, they had a California JUCO kid before on their roster who was a All-American. And it was good. I, I had probably one of the roughest starts to anyone's career. I was horrible uh, when it came to field goal and horrible on punt. I'd never punted before. And they said, hey, we saw in a camp that you could punt. And I said, oh, yeah, but I'm, I'm really a field goal kickoff guy. And uh, they said, no, you're, you're going to punt here too. And I, it was awful, Keith. I was, I was really bad. But having the, you know, the, again, the work ethic, I had a little wall above my bedroom that said Fusick. Fusick is for everyone who said I can't. And I had some great posts on Twitter and Instagram about, people talking smack or me working out and people commenting like, Oh, he's probably going to yank it left again. Uh, he's probably going to miss this one. Um, had that. And people said it was a little negative, but it was, it fueled me uh, every day when I go work out and, you know, it was Pennsylvania in the winter time and there was snow all over the ground. And I went to my coach, my head coach, Ramon Flanagan, he played at SMU, was a death penalty quarterback. And I said, Hey coach, I need the keys. I'm going to go out and kick. And he said, now Brett, why would you want to go and do that? It's 15 degrees. There's snow on the ground. Why would you want to go out there and kick? I told him, Coach, right now in California, all those guys are getting work in. I should be working too and trying to get better. So that's just a little snapshot of the work ethic. I had to, I had to do all the little things right, and that's something we always tell our, our walk-ons or specialists in general, like, hey, you got to work that much harder to be respected and, and you know, be successful and gain respect of your peers. So – uh, second season ended up going, or you know, 2015 had the longest punt in the nation, set three school records, and a grad transfer to UT Martin, uh, in West Tennessee, where I got linked up with Jordan Hankins, uh, which eventually led me to my first opportunity coaching at Marshall University in West Virginia. Yeah, it's a heck of a journey going from someone who was awful at punting to having an 80-yard punt. Yeah, <laughs> definitely uh, some improvement there. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and the thing too is being small. You look at these NFL punters, man. They're anywhere from six foot six one to six five. I mean, Johnny Hecker and some. You know, they're always the bigger body. So I thought, you know, never in my life would I ever become a punter. I'm I'm short, probably five seven five eight. I'll just be a kicker and kickoff guy. But you know, just a heads up to all those high school specialists. Never put yourself in a corner by being just a field goal or a kickoff guy. Make sure you do all three and keep all your options open recruiting. Because the coach might like your personality, but say, hey, we, we really need a punter right now. Well, it, you might come on as a punter, but your field goal guy might get hurt. I did a lot of field goals. I did all three at Lincoln. And then at UT Martin, I ended up doing mainly punting, but I ended up kicking 10. I had 10 attempts at UT Martin field goal-wise and went 9 for 10. So I got some you know, play that way. But, but definitely keeping all your options open and, and getting really good at the fundamentals helped me out in my career. Yeah, so you mentioned the work ethic and the drive that you had and, you know, the, the, the saying above your bed, et cetera. But it seems like there's something along the way. You kind of cracked the code on how to do this the right way. So for those coaches out there, and we've, we've all been in those situations where you're uh, constantly looking for, do we have anybody who could punt? Because you know, there's a <laughs> lot of high schools you go to. And, I mean, we've been in the situation at small college and someone, you'd get hurt and you don't have that guy anymore and you're looking, hey, who punted in high school? Yeah. What are the key things that you can do as a coach to, I guess for lack of better words, manufacture a punter? Some of the key things you'd focus on if you got a guy who has maybe a little bit of talent, at least can get the ball off of his foot, sure. to be able to be serviceable and do something to help you on game day. Sure, absolutely. Well, the cool thing about that, Keith, is, I spent some time at Smyrna High School outside of Nashville, taught and coached my first two years 
after UT Martin. So this is 2018, about 2020. And that's exactly the position we're in. I mean, we have two kickers, we have no punter. And we're like looking around like, what are we going to do? We have no one to put out there. The best thing you can look for, especially at a high school or a small college level, is, all right, let's find our best athlete. Kicking is more, hey, let's find a soccer guy who's kicked before. You know, punting is more, let's get a good athlete and kind of work with him in a few different areas. I'd say a few things you can do. We ended up taking our quarterback that year, who was a freshman, and he was 6'2", and he could boot the ball. Really work on the drop. So I did a little talk recently. A few drills you can do with your punter is, Let's get the drop right first, right? Like if, if you're moving the ball around and you're tossing all over the place, it's going to be hard to hit a good punt. I work for John Baxter here, and it's amazing because he loves tying in different sports and different disciplines, and it helps our players retain things better. He loves talking about baseball. So when I'm talking about a drop for a punter, imagine a hitter in baseball. You know, what's going to be easier to hit? Is it going to be a fastball that's right down the middle on a line? or a curveball or some type of knuckleball that's moving all over the place. It's going to be a fastball, right? Same thing with our punt drops. We want to make sure we catch that ball as far out as possible, and we get it right off that punting hip. So it should be a little bit lower than the chest level, anywhere from the waist to below the nipples, and it should be outside of the hip, slightly outside the hip. So if you're standing behind a punter, you can see the outside panel. He's going to drop that. Uh, right over his outside hip, he's going to be eyes are going to be trained in the eye in the in Adidas or the nipple of that ball, and he's going to be seeing that underside of the ball. That's his sweet spot there. So a lot of problems with high school punters comes from their line, walking their line, right? Everything we want to do in kicking, punting, and snapping needs to be linear. So the easiest thing to do is get them on a line, right, across the field. And just have him punt back and forth, cross the line, cross the line. He's a right-footed punter, Keith. You want that left foot against the line. And think about your gait, right, when you're walking. You want to make sure that those feet, uh, they're naturally going to cross or come closer together, right? No one walks like square box style. But what we want to make sure is that that left foot never crosses over the line or over his body. So, if he does do that, he's going to have to open up his right hip and swing across. Does that make sense? Yep. So, yeah, keeping everything in the line, making sure that left foot doesn't cross. Hitting balls across the field, whether that's one steps, punt passes, which are different ways to break down your swing and whatever we're doing, you know, that's what drills are, whether it's quarterbacks or we're working linebackers, working on tackling drills. We're trying to break things down into more digestible parts. So drops – talk about a lot of different drills in the book, shameless plug for the kicker's Bible that will work on laces spaces, which is catching the ball, noticing if the laces are on top, you'll say laces, the laces are on bottom, you'll say spaces, and then you'll spin the ball and get to the correct drop height. So working on a line and working on your hands is a great starting point for anyone looking for a punter. Jumping ahead, let's let's take a look at the kicking side of things. Let's get into practice here a little bit too. Yeah. And before we got going, uh, I was telling you we had Taylor Melhaf on, who at the time was with Wisconsin, and Charlie Coiner, longtime NFL special teams coach, uh, guest hosted a series with me, and he subtitled this one. It's period five. Do you know where your kickers are? <laughs> and that's a good question because. In a lot of places I've been, even when I've been a head coach, I mean, we really didn't have a kicker's coach. We There's staffs I had where we didn't really have anybody who had knowledge of or had kicked before. So, you know, a lot of this was left, they're, they're left to their, their own devices. They do know something. <laughs> a lot of these kickers now go out to camps, they learn things. And in some ways you're trusting, okay, he knows the work he needs to get in. You know, how many kicks? I mean... You know, some of them I, I, I'd have to tell them, like, dude, like, you have to kick on Friday. Let's let's chill a little bit on all the kicks you're taking today. Exactly. So I guess looking at that and almost like what's a formula we can think of of how much work and volume these guys should get over the course of a week, what days should it be on, and, you know, how can we make sure that we're getting the best out of those guys on a, a Friday night or a Saturday afternoon? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question, Keith. 
that's probably one of the most commonly asked questions I've heard is like, how many kicks should I be doing with my specialist and what can I do to help them? Like, let's, let's break it down from the start. What, how do great special teams coaches or great coaches in general help specialists? They use their eyes. You know, Randy Brown was on a, a podcast and he was saying that he's like a caddy in golf, right? Like he's not in there every, and even the best need instruction. You know, Justin Tucker, he still needs uh, instruction, but it's not every play that you're in there saying something or every kick. He's using his eyes. If Justin says, hey, I need you to watch my plant foot. Okay, well, then he's going to watch his plant foot. That's just an example. And then ask questions with the specialist. You know, hey, how much is too much? How many kicks do you want to do here? What's something that you're working on right now that what's a saying or a mental cue is what I tell our guys. What's a mental cue that you think of that will help you when you do go to make contact with that ball? So those are things we can do without having a background and then just talk to people and ask questions just like we're doing now is, you know, talking about it. Uh, that helps a lot. I'd say this is pretty cool. I've worked with David Akers on this, who, you know, had some success. He's only an Eagles Hall of Famer. And I'm so lucky to have him and, and Shane Graham in on the Kickers Bible. And they gave me a lot of input and allowed me to have them in my book. So this is a section in there where we talk about the off-season schedule. And this is huge, huge, because, Keith, it tells us, you know, how many kicks should they be doing. Now, with Dave, he wouldn't start kicking until April after the season ended. He would take three months off. With our high school and college specialists, it's definitely good to take time off. That's needed, two weeks, maybe three weeks. But there needs to be some type of time period where you got to get them back. You know, for example, here at Fresno State, we did spring ball in March where we can't just not kick until – practice one and say hey let's roll on out there let's see what we got you know so i kind of advise like for high school specialists and college that you're going to start spring ball in march maybe or, or late february january to february they need to be doing 15 to 35 reps two times a week and that's 15 to 35 reps a day march through june more 30 to 40 and that's three times a week and then july to august 35 to 50 four times a week now this is not a one size fits all thing. You know, it's, it's up to your specialist and how he feels comfortable, but we at least got to give them a routine, right? Give them a plan so they can go out there and be successful every day. Don't just let them go out there and go on the side field and dick around. You look around out there and they're playing uh, kick golf or something or playing tag. What should they be focusing on in the off season is their fundamentals. You know, it was cool. I got to sit in with uh, Mark Tarmadal, He's at TCU, and he was giving a special teams talk at Rice University a year or two ago, and he was saying that on average, an NFL field goal, do you know how far it is, Keith? I do not, no. From the 19-yard line, it's a 37-yard field goal, okay? So even for us, right, our college and high school specialists, you know, that's not far at all. I'm going to have those guys 30 to 35 yards down the middle in the offseason, and they're just working on hitting good rotational balls, and night straight balls. And then punters, like we talked about with basic drills, they should be on the line every time. When I came back from Lincoln and I was training after that horrible freshman season, I would get on the line with my dad and we'd hit 25 to 30 punts, just five punts one way, five punts the other way. And I'm just working across the field, uh, working on my plant foot. And then snappers, they need to be working on their efficiency of their snap, whether that's body control, whether that's slow motion snaps, flexibility stuff i think that with working with dave too he was huge on the physical training of the body too you know what i mean like it's not just the kicking and punting but what should they be doing to their bodies in this off season and make sure they're getting getting right so he'd have his guys do you know a full body stretch five days a week then doing some type of dry runs which is you're swinging but without the ball we want to make sure we replicate that motion without, um, you know, tiring out the leg by hitting too many balls. And then we should be doing some type of core stability or core work five days a week. Then four days a week, there should be some type of sprints, some type of stairs, some type of L drills, some change of direction drills, then some glute and hip work. Three days a week should be balance swings, foundational training, and then one day a week yoga. So, again, giving them a general plan of stuff to do and to focus on helps put them in a good routine by the time season comes around. 
Does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. I think routine is key in, in giving those guys some things to do. I was just, as you were talking, thinking back to my days as a, a head coach in high school, and this is, you know, 20-some years ago, <laughs> <laughs> and wondering, you know, man, we did all that work all summer long. I know I would have one kicker out there, but, I, you know, our, our, our punter was, you know, a tight end or receiver or something like that. Yep. I don't think we had him punt the ball probably to a camp starter, right? Like, so <laughs> so we were putting him beyond the eight ball. But I think you bring up some important points on just ramping those guys up so you're not hitting camp day one and it's the first time a ball's coming off, you know, the foot of one of those guys. I mean, they're going to get their work in. You have the time to do some of that stuff in practice, pre-practice, mm -hmm. whatever. But, you know, uh, especially those position guys, um, you want to make sure they're doing some of that, though, before they get into camp. Yeah, 100%. And, you know, part of it, too, Keith, is just the making them accountable. You know, like that's the, the biggest thing I see out of great specialist groups is they hold themselves accountable. At Virginia Tech, when I got to work with James Shebus, and, you know, I'm lucky. I've been able to work with James Shebus, who was a football scoop, you know, special teams coordinator of the year in 2008 and 17. And then John Baxter, which, you know, I don't think he gets enough credit. He was special teams coordinator of the year in 2011, but he's had multiple seasons where he's blocked six, seven punts. Between those two, I've, I've learned, I've gotten to learn a lot about great specialists. What do they do? You know, they hold each other accountable. And this could be at the high school level. You know, you give them a schedule, you give them some a little document type stuff, and you tell the leader of that group, right, or the oldest one, it might be the punter or the kicker, hey, you make sure your teammates are out there getting work together. Because I think where a lot of high school Google operations fail from just seeing it from my point of view is they don't really work on the snap, hold, and kick, right? There's It's hard. And I get it. You know, some guys play other positions, but in the off season, even they should be getting together and as many times as possible, you work on that snap, hold, and kick. You work on your tight end who plays, you know, he's the punter during the season. He gets out there twice a week when he can with the guys. and You know, they enjoy their time together. They become more close-knit close, close -knit, they become a battery. As coaches, we know that some of the biggest hurdles to our team's success can come from off the field. Your team needs support to tackle the endless list of expenses, uniforms, training equipment, travel, and more. But raising that money can feel like a full-time job. Thankfully, there's Vertical Raise. Vertical Raise is the premier online fundraising platform using innovative technology to create the easiest and most efficient system available. Raise more money in less time with a local fundraising coach who works with your team every step of the way to customize the ideal fundraiser. With options for online donations, digital discount cards, premium product sales, and even spirit shops, Vertical Raise has top-of-the-line solutions for every fundraising style. To find out more, visit verticalraise.com and we'll get you connected with an exclusive offer on your first fundraiser. I wanted to get in. You mentioned the snappers. I think the holders as well. I mean, all those things are important, the mechanics of that play and things going right. So I'd love to hear, too, the work and the, the volume and the things you'd like to do to prepare those guys so that you're having the efficient operation, you're not getting punts blocked or ball rolling all over the place on, a, on an extra point or field goal, right? All those are important things. So talk to us a little bit about those two positions, the, the long snapper, the short snapper as well, and the holder. Yeah, yeah, that's every coach's biggest fear, right? And you're going into a Friday night game, and you're punting out of your, you know, your own side. Maybe you're on your 15 yard line, and snap goes right over the punter's head, and you think, "Oh my God, like, what are we doing? What are we going to do? You know, this is awful." And you could be like Weber State, no, no shade there, but they had a snapper that snapped the ball over their punter's head four times. In one game, actually, and that was – that's tough. It's tough. You, I don't I don't ever, you know, wish bad upon other special teams, coaches, other uh, kickers. You just feel for them, you know, because you know what that feeling is like, that oh, oh, crap moment. So I've been lucky to work with some great snappers and talk with some great snapping coaches. The same thing. It's, it wasn't my specialty, you know, but even starting with Bobby Dackett, who was our snapper at – UT Martin, he transferred from Ole Miss and was a big, you know, Rubio top 10 guy, Oscar Shadley at Virginia Tech. And then my guys that I got here at Fresno State, 
just ask them, you know, where, where do you start with that? And I think a lot of it has to do with that crunch. A lot of times with snappers, you'll see them lock their arms out and just launch the ball up into the air, right? And we really want to avoid that. We're trying to create that whip motion that you see. And the way Cal Seltzer broke it down, special teams, you snapping guys on my podcast and taught me a lot is, I like to say, to simplify, it's chin, elbows, and core. You know, in that order, chin, tucking that chin into your neck activates the elbows in a bent 90-degree position and then activating or squeezing that core using your full body to launch that ball back there. So a couple of things that you can do and train with your guys is like scoot snaps. So in this presentation I did recently, and you can find in the in the book, The Kicker's Bible, but Mike Munoz, our snapper, puts both arms across his chest. He's in a snapping position, and he's not working the upper body at all. He's just working, he's on digging that chin into his chest and then locking out his legs and scooting backwards. So he's trying to activate that body while working the first part, which is the chin. And then after that, he'd do straight leg snaps. So now he's taking the legs out of it and he's really working on tucking the chin, driving the elbows and activating the core and then holding his ball through. There's a lot of good drills. And again, you guys are more than welcome to reach out to me and uh, reach out to you know, on any, any platforms, but there's a lot of fun drills you can do with those specialists or specifically long snappers with uh, a softball, you know, Kyle Seltzer is big on using a softball and slapping the ball um, back. It's on the ground. He's working on driving his hands through and slapping the ball back so that both hands are even in their fall through or, you know, a pull through snap drill, which is you're going and you're going to full motion snap. And then the coach is standing behind and he's going to grab onto the snapper's hands and pull the hands back, really mimicking or replicating the follow through. We, we tell our snappers keep that their hands are bullets, right? And they're trying to throw them through the punter's hip, not throwing it to them. I think that's one of the biggest common errors with high school snappers, in my opinion, is just launching it or just lobbing it back to the punter, just getting it to him. No, we should be throwing through him just like a pitcher would uh, in baseball, right? Throwing it through a catcher. So those are some good drills for that. I think holding an easy one you can do with your holders, especially if you know you got a quarterback. I mean, get them together 10 minutes before practice and have the snapper snap to the holder and the, the kicker will go through his motion, but he won't swing, right? He'll do his full steps. He'll swing through the ball, maybe a little bit wider, but he's working on the timing. And what they're really working on, the snapper and holder, is that operation Getting that, catching that ball out in front and hitting his spot. We'll do a rapid fire drill. So either the snappers will snap as fast as they can, or I'll get down there on a knee and I'll fire him five balls. And that holder can't even think. He's just trying to catch the ball out in front, get it to his spot. Catch the ball in front, get it to his spot. He just tosses the ball to the side. I, I think with a lot of specialists that overthink really good drills to do, even for punters, right, is – doing rapid fire drills. So they're not thinking now and they're just working on hitting a good ball or holders aren't thinking they're just working on catching the ball in front, getting to his spot, catch the ball in front, getting to his spot, little stuff like that, you know, that you can do 10 or 15 minutes before practice or 10 or 15 minutes after practice. Now, those are some great recommendations and I know you've put together some great resources. I want to make sure that we talk a little bit about the book you put together here. I think a great resource for coaches especially as you're heading into summer and maybe thinking about this a little bit more. But tell us a little bit about the book and the other resources you have for coaches. Yeah, I appreciate that. Keith, you bring that up. Yeah, it's called the Kicker's Bible. You know, the, the story behind it was I spent 10 years working on it while I was playing. Chandler Catanzaro was a kicker for Auburn. He played for the Cardinals, among other teams. And he said he always kept a log or journal, you know, things that, he did or what he was feeling good what was what he, he was thinking about when he was feeling bad so I got to work with uh, some great kicking coaches Armin Turrigan and uh, Coach Hicks here in, in the Fresno Valley among others and Brian Jackson and so I just kept notes of when I played and finally during COVID I sat down I'd been hanging over my head you know something oh I think I'll just I'll finish it really quickly it'll be really easy you know kind of like podcasting you think oh, I'll just pop one out 
and realize, you know, two or three years later, like, oh, I haven't finished this at all. So I'm going into 2020 and I'm like, I'm knocking it out. And shout out to Julie Wilson. I was, I was able to find a, an editor at a grad school and she ended up working with me and, and just getting to work with so many cool coaches. The whole reason I do the podcast and the book, Keith, is trying to give back to kids who were kind of like me. When I was trying to figure things out, you know, I had no real direction. I was going on YouTube and watching videos and trying to give them connections and resources to guys who have done it the highest level, like you or coached at the highest level, or kicked at the highest level. And they're the coolest thing about the book is that these guys, David Akers, is a good story. We were in Nashville. We played them, played his son's team that year. And uh, we went to, uh, I eventually met him at the game, you know, piercing blue eyes. And I said, hey, Dave, I'm, I'm Brett. Nice to meet you. Hey, hey, man, how's it going? You know, it's kind of a high pitch voice. And he's talking about his son kicking. And I said, you mind if we ever go to, like, you know, just talk some ball sometime? Yeah, love that. And Keith, I'm not lying to you. This is a true story. We're at, uh, in Franklin, Tennessee at a Starbucks at 930 at night. And they're closing it down. We've been talking for two hours, and he's great. He's just telling me all this different stuff he does with his son, all the different workouts. And they said, hey, you guys got to leave. And he goes, okay. And he goes, hey, you want to go in the parking lot? I'll, I'll show you what I'm talking about with this punt, um, <laughs> fundamentals. So he's, he's you know, he goes, you got to keep your chest front forward. You got to get your hips back. And he's and showing me his swing, and it's 10 o'clock now. And it's freaking cold outside. I'm like, what? what is going on here? What is my life? I'm getting to chop it up here with a, you know, Pro Bowl specialist. So just lucky to have guys like David Akers and, and Shane Graham hop on that book. It's got, you know, input from over 20 different specialists. And I think how it's different is uh, it's got a lot about a mental game. I'm, I'm, I might be a controversial statement here, Keith, but I believe that if your book is only 35 pages, it's not a book. Okay. It's a short story. It's a fable. It's a novelette, not taken away from any guys that have Probably some some twenty eight and thirty five page uh, books. Well, that, officially, it's 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 a pamphlet. <laughs> there you go. That's what I'm saying. It's a pamphlet. It's a yeah. It's a little novella, novella a little fable. This is 180 pages. I've spent a lot of time working on it, and uh, I've gotten some amazing input from some great guys. So, yeah, that's that's kind of how it's, it differs. It spends a lot of time on the mental game, recruiting, on weather, uh, on all different fundamentals. So. I'm, I'm lucky to be able to learn from the people I have and, and give back to hopefully someone. Someone can get something out of the book. And you have some conversations you're having with coaches as well on the Iceman podcast. Tell us about your podcast. That's right. Yeah, the Iceman podcast. And been doing that for two or three. I was definitely motivated or inspired by guys like you that was just putting out awesome content. That started during COVID, and I just posted a book, and I'm feeling all proud, and okay, I can relax now. You know, I've, I've done what I need to do, what I set out to do with that book, and Clint McMillan, who's with the Titans now, he coached me at UT Martin, he goes, dude, you should do a podcast, and it, you know, Clint, he's, he's a very chill dude, awesome dude from Florida, his parents were like line tamers when he was younger, so he's, he's got an awesome insight and a great person to talk to, uh, and I said, a podcast for what? I'm like, why would I need to do that he goes you know advertise your book uh and get some cool coaches on there and, and do some networking and i was like yeah that's actually a really smart idea so i said i'll only do it if you're one of my first guests clint he said all right done deal so i'm proud to have him on there yeah i've had some some awesome guests guys like adam benetary uh david Akers, uh some some great coaches just had todd goble from nc state on there so. yeah i saw that one Top five such things coordinator, yeah. So, um, we'll have to get you on there, Keith, for sure. But uh, there's <laughs> some there's some great great talks, and and I love just hearing stories. That, you know, sometimes some of the best stories. My dad's an avid avid listener and great supporter of the, the Ice Man podcast. But he said, you know, some of the best or most fun stories to listen to are not these specialists or these coaches when they've made it, but their come up, right? Or their mm -hmm. failure, you know, not even making the JV team or their high school team or getting cut and David Akers and, you know, and being flown out to Philly on Christmas Eve for a tryout and he thinks he did horrible and turns out he made the team or coaches that have gotten fired, you know, time and time again. Um, that's one thing I am proud of. I haven't been doing this for a long time, but already been fired twice. And I know that, uh, you know, if you're a good coach, uh, it's only a matter of time before you get 
inspired. So I try to wear that proudly and, and uh, you know, it's a, it's a cool, cool thing to, to be able to network and meet coaches such as yourself. Well, love what you're doing out there. It's a great story that you had, all the stuff you've shared with us, tremendous information. Certainly welcome back anytime and keep, keep doing a, a bunch of great stuff for coaches. I think, you know, we're, we're able to use some of these platforms to give back to the game and help the game. And ultimately it makes us all better. So thank you for what you do and good luck to you and the Bulldogs in 2023. Thanks a lot, Keith. I appreciate it. That's the last thing I'll, I'll, I'll end with here. It's, you know, we're, we're, we're fighting stereotypes here as a specialist, man. We're trying to break through all these uh, stereotypes of just, you know, being lazy and all about ourselves. And so any way I can give back to specialists or coaches or help out and get to learn from new coaches, I think it's, it's definitely worth my while. So thanks again for having me on here. Here are our winning edge takeaways and ideas for implementation. One, if you do not have a coach who is trained and knowledgeable on coaching the specialist, then divide and conquer. It's a lot for a single coach to take on all four disciplines of kicking, punting, snapping, and holding. Even if you do have that single coach, think of appointing an assistant to each discipline and having them train to learn more and be able to see little things that can be coached up. In your pre-practice or practice specialist periods, have those coaches work with the players in each discipline to get more coaching. During that time, you can have other individuals like returners, cover guys, etc. doing individual drills as well. The cumulative effect of this coaching will pay off big time in season. Two, focus on key components of each specialist. Coach Arkelian talked about specifics for each position, like the drop for the punter as an example. After your coach is assigned to a specialist for development, being able to just start with key components will make a difference. The specialist and his or her coach can then start building on that, and if the coach doesn't have a ton of experience prior to this, they can grow together. Three, train the areas where things happen most. When we look at third down on offense or defense, we prepare and rep third and medium the most. That doesn't mean we don't work on the other parts. We just spend time on what will happen the most. While in the NFL, kickers can kick over 60-yard field goals, the average line of scrimmage for a field goal is just over the 19-yard line. Train your specialists for the areas which they can become the most effective in executing and that will make the biggest difference. Be sure to check out all the resources from Coach Arkelian. Those are listed in the show notes. Go to coachingcoordinator.com for our enhanced show notes, which include our winning edge takeaways detailed in text, links to resources, related episodes, and articles. Sign up for our weekly tip sheet, which shares the best ideas from the previous week. Follow me on Twitter at Coach K Grabowski. <laughs>